Start all over. <laughs> all right. Um, in case of an emergency, please use the exit to the back of the room and follow the hallway to the exit. Exits in the building. Tonight is our budget hearing. This is uh, this is the last. Well, we'll we can continue to talk about it, but there is no opportunity to change the budget. It's just a budget presentation, and I hand the mic over to Mr. Bartels or Dr. Johnson. Uh, no, I'm going to turn it right over to Mr. Bartels. Okay, thank you, Dr. Johnson. As Mr. O'Shea said, this is uh, a formal budget hearing. Uh, this is a required hearing by the state, and we cannot make any changes to the budget this time. Uh, it's really more informative about what the budget is and what the impact is uh, on the uh, tax, on the taxes. Uh, the budget increase uh, that we have for this year is a 3.97% increase. And uh, that will translate into a tax levy increase of 2.98%. Uh, that tax levy will be uh, under the tax cap for this year. The tax cap for Rockville Center for uh, this coming school year is 3.03%. So at 2.98, we are below the tax cap. Um, this is going to translate uh, into an approximate increase of 2.8% on an individual homeowner's taxes, the average home in Rockville Center uh, for next year based on uh, preliminary information that we have from the Nassau County Assessor's Office has dropped to $423,600. Um, the average increase at 2.8% would equate to approximately $347 increase uh, in, in average homeowner's school taxes for next year. That's that's where we stand on the budget. Any board members have any questions or comments? All right, I'd like to open the mic to anybody who has any uh, to who wants to address anything in relation to the budget. Please leave, give your name and address. Jeff Greenfield, citizen taxpayer, Yuba Court. Within the budget, where do I find the security line? Where, and how many vehicles do we have for security? How many vehicles do we have yeah. for security? We have, um, we have two main security vehicles which go around the district, um, and we have a couple that are used here at uh, the high school. OK. Um, Shouldn't they? I, I've seen some around in the elementary schools. Shouldn't they all be marked? Do they they were just marked this past we just week. Just marked them this week, Jeffrey. You read they're, my mind. They're all marked with security. We read your mind, right? <laughs> they put security on the sides and the back of the vehicle. That, I think that's very important. We don't need unmarked yep. cars. You just did okay. that last week. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. What about where it's listed in the budget? Uh, it, so, it's. I'm just happy that they're wrong. Oh, okay. You want me back? <laughs> no, no. I just, you, that was just part of your question. And okay, so which, where is the security? Is it broken? Well, those separate? those lines would be under um, uh, facilities and, and equipment increases, but we don't have any new security cars planned no, for next I, year. Security is it a separate line in the budget? No, no. It falls under several different locations. Okay. Yeah. We have a wait. I'm sorry. We have a lot of security plans in the capital. Yes. No, he was asking about the cars, that's I why. Know. And but also employees, no, 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 security guards. In general, guards. I want to know, you know, what. Yeah. We have, we have, oh, well, we have, I don't want we have quite a bit. I don't want people to insecure that we're not spending a lot of money on security. No, we, we are spending a lot. We have uh, uh, put in the budget a transfer to capital of $1.5 million this year. A great deal of that is going to be going towards securing the buildings. Uh, I think we've talked a great deal about what we're going to be doing as far as putting in uh, ante rooms in each of the buildings. Right. So we're going to set those meetings. Uh, so we're going to be have secure entrances, um, and uh, we have our security guards, which are listed under staffing. Uh, we have security supplies. So should so we list like all the security items on one budget line? They could make yes, the public feel better. You know, interesting yeah. enough, you know, I, we, we don't disagree with that, Jeffrey. The state doesn't give us any opportunity. There's, there is no line in the budget in the state. We, we have to follow the state uh, right. 
the state reporting right. format, which is called the ST3, and it's done by function to start with. There is no function for security. Really? Nope. No. None whatsoever. No. So it, it all goes under so the 1600. So tell the state, Jeff Griefy would like to see a separate line. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jeff, right. you have okay. to go to Albany. Yeah. Yeah. And give me another cause, thank you. I suspect it may be there one of these days, but it's it not should there be. Now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Would anybody else like to come up and speak speak to the budget? So that is that concludes our budget hearing portion of the meeting. Uh, items for information. <coughs> The, uh, the first item up is, is a, uh, uh, just really to provide an opportunity for us to notify, uh, and hopefully people are watching this on their TVs, uh, the, on election day, which is uh, May 15th, we have changed some of the procedures that we have here at Southside High School during that day. Uh, I probably should turn this over to Jackie, if you don't mind. Uh, well, unless you would like me to do it, I'd be very happy to. Uh, we have a single we have a single location uh, that will be used for all the people who are coming, both those who are employed during the day as workers, and anybody coming to vote during the school day. So that beginning at seven o'clock in the morning, through two thirty-five or two forty in the afternoon, there will only be one entrance open to voters, and it's going to be on the south side uh, entrance. Uh, that falls in between the cafeteria and the loading dock. Uh, there will be plenty of staff members available to usher people, as it were, to reserved parking immediately adjacent to that door. And then once inside, there will be a number of people uh, who will be guiding them from that location to the gym. The front doors to the building will be closed to any visitors other than those who are coming in for business with the high school. So the voters are not to enter the front of the building. But that will be clearly signed that day. We're going to make sure that everybody knows that and that voters will be guided to that one location. You're talking next to the boiler room? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We, we, it's not, a, yes, it wouldn't be an unusual door to use. That's one of the doors that's typically used for voting. We're just pushing all the guests, the visitors to that door. But during the day, Jeffrey, people used to come in the front door. Yes. And a, probably a third of the people who entered during the school day used to enter through that front door. That's going to be closed to voters that day. The only opportunity for voters to come into the building will be at that one location. So there'll be no artwork for us to look at. After 2.30 in the afternoon, once the kids are released and the buses are gone, then we're going to open up all the, 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 the building will be open. We are going to have an art exhibit, okay. and we will have music. This so we have both. <laughs> well, at 7 o'clock in the morning, they're not going to be there. I'm sorry. I know you're the first one in, usually. Now come at 7, and then come back in the evening, and then you can enjoy the art and the music without having to worry about right. waiting online. All right. Dr. Johnson, next one. Next generation ELA and math standards. Yeah. Uh, the Common Core fell on hard times in New York State. And the commissioner uh, really as, as pretty much pushed into it by the, uh, the Board of Regents uh, went back to the drawing board and redid the Common Core so that it made more sense for New York. They called it the Next Generation Standards. Uh, we are very happy to have Dr. Pelletieri tonight, who will introduce two of our guests, who will then talk to us about ELA and mass standards. So Dr. Pelletieri, if you would, please. Dr. Johnson, thank you very much. I don't think I'm on here. No, you're not on. The back. There's a button on the very back of it. OK. How's that? I think I'm on there you now. Go. OK. Can you hear me now? So uh, thank you, Dr. Johnson. Yes, uh, we, we in New York State had, as, as many uh, states, uh, adopted Common Core standards across the nation. And as Dr. Johnson uh, said, kind of fell on hard times. And, and a new effort began in, in New York uh, a couple of years ago. And tonight, uh, Darnell McCallum, uh, known as uh, 
uh, Mr. Mack at the middle school, one of our math teachers, and uh, Amy O'Leary, Mrs. O'Leary from Wilson School are here. They're taking part in an administration cohort and program that actually takes place here in the evenings at uh, Southside High School. They're getting out of class tonight. We have to write them a note to get them back in there. Uh, we walked past their class uh, just before as we were on our way to the conference room. But they uh, uh, have to do hours as part of their program, so we, of course, put them to work here in the district. And they're going to give us their insights. They've become real experts in uh, the new learning standards, as Dr. Johnson again mentioned, New York State Next Generation Learning Standards, ELA and Math. So, Donnell, I think you're going to start. It's good night, everyone. My name is Donald McCallum, and I teach at the middle school. I teach seventh grade, and we'll be talking about the Next Generation Standards tonight. So I'm sure that's on. It's on. All right. So tonight we'll be going over the history, the pushback, our actual next generation standards, how the Common Core weighs against the next generation standards, and also a small timeline. I believe in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you came from. All right. As we've mentioned, our Common Core came across some hard times, and we initially began with the Common Core. Now we're moving to the next generation, and because my field of interest is math, I'm going to start off with some math. All right, so the Common Core mainly started to improve student achievement and prepare students for their career and also for college. All right, it wanted to promote critical thinking and have the students just get away from always memorizing things and doing things through rote. It was adopted initially by 42 states. And the whole idea was to possibly have us just catch up in the educational field. Because if you compare us to other countries, we may not sit at the highest, but we're still doing well. And our main target was to have, whenever we have a student move across the country, we just wanted to have like an even playing field. No matter what grade you moved in, if you were going from New York to Cali, at least you'll still be reviewing the same content. Unfortunately, the Common Core had a lot of pushback. Some of the reasons was because of the federal government's encroachment on states' rights. And in all honesty, f for me as a teacher, I wasn't teaching at the time, but the implementation, as I've heard from a lot of teachers, there was big setbacks due to the implementation. Oh, that sounds way better. Ooh, there we go. All right, and when we talk about this implementation, like as a math teacher myself, I can see like when I'm helping out a sixth grader that I know my math, and I feel I know it very well. And I can imagine that some of us are very educated. We know our content very well. But when you're trying to help some of the youth, you see that they're learning in such a different way than what we've learned ourselves. So some of the teachers honestly weren't prepared. They were stuck in teaching it how they were taught. And they didn't really want to buy in because of the implementation wasn't as smooth as it could have been. You know, Donnell, I'm just going to jump in for a second. I think a lot of that was due to the fact that we kind of rolled it out, not kind of, we rolled it out really fast here in New York. The idea was we're going to jump in. I remember Merrill Tisch, the commissioner at that time, saying, or head of the Board of Regents, uh, we are going to throw them in the deep end and, and let them swim. And that was not a great idea, I don't think. <laughs> Definitely. And another thing that we started to realize as certain schools started to adopt the Common Core, the demand for technology, a lot, of, a lot of places couldn't really keep up because it was so expensive dealing with the textbooks or the other technologies that other places would like. And there was also a failure to engage our stakeholders. They didn't really feel like they were too well informed. So there was a lot of setbacks due to that. When it was initially adopted, we had around 44 states by the end of 2011. This initially happened in 2010, February. And as you can see here, some places never really got along to adopt it. We had up here in one place only took one subject, which was ELA. And in blue, some states adopted it at first and then reversed their order. Later on, we lost several states along the way. Now we have around 36 states that still use the Common Core. 10 of them replaced it or rewrote it to some extent. As we mentioned earlier, four of them never really adopted it. And that one still stuck with ELA. 
So now we're here at the point where we're adopting the next generation math standards. And what this is really made to do is to kind of have a constructivist approach where we're building on their past experiences, bless you, and also what they've learned in the classroom. It's not going to just stick with what we've dealt with in the Common Core. We're going to build with the Common Core as a foundation. And as always, the goal is to successfully transition our students into post-secondary edu post education, along with being able to go into the f workforce seamlessly. All right, so when we compare the two, one of the things about the Common Core, as we mentioned earlier, was that it was rolled out fairly quickly. There wasn't a lot of training for teachers. A lot of people didn't have a lot of the knowledge, and therefore there was a lot of resentment. As teachers, we felt like there was a chance. We didn't have a lot of opportunity to collaborate amongst one another, and that also built like a domino effect as far as the buy-in amongst the people that were practicing it. I just had a little picture here. We have a little family. One of them says, I'm not a guinea, you know, because we're trying out these standards on the students, but the teachers aren't buying in, parents aren't buying in. It didn't work out as well in our favor as we like, and that's why today we're actually going to try the next generation standards. All right, so when we talk about the next generation standards, it was rewritten by experts in child development. And one of the greatest things that they did, in my opinion, was that they took about 4,000 public comments from parents, educators, etc., and they actually thoroughly reviewed through them, and then they implemented some of their ideas into the standards themselves. The Common Core was very fact-based. It de-emphasized rote learning. And then on the other hand, we had our next generation, which really aimed to have more of a play base. So maybe at times you notice that it's going to be aiming to have more exciting activities involved with either math or ELA, just so the kids get a chance to be kids again, and they're not just so focused on just the conceptual understandings. The next generation science standards, which we'll talk about in the future, same, same approach, very much hands-on and, and play-based. All right, so here's just gonna be a close look at the difference between the Common Core. Even if you can't read it, just taking a look at the text, very close paragraph form. And as a teacher, when you're trying to look for a couple of standards and you see this big paragraph, no one really wants to just reread the whole thing over and over and copy paste. It's just a little bit better and easier on the eyes once they abridge the text, as you can see here for the next generation. And they also add a little note for you on what you can use. So over here we have cubes, paper clips, and just letting you know what also goes along with the standards. And this goes along with the elementary first grade. So that was a concern that they suggested teaching or, or want you to teach uh, length units, but no means by which to actually teach them. What tools should we be using now they have implemented or have put in tools such as cubes, paper clips, et cetera? Quick look at sixth grade. Again, we have a pretty thick paragraph, and this one was talking about the students can use a strategy of their choice. And when we come down here, we're just saying that now students can use ratio and rate reasoning to solve real world experiences. And again, we're showing you exactly what they can use. We have a tape diagram, as we've noted over here. Also a double number line. And these are just some of the things that just make it easier for both your educators and also your students in the classroom. Other things that are gonna be amended in the next generation standards are that some of the standards are gonna be removed or even placed into another grade level. For instance, I'm a seventh grade teacher and something such as mean absolute deviation and the interquartile range is gonna be moved out of the sixth grade curriculum. And now it's actually gonna be moved into a seventh grade class where it makes a little bit more sense and there's just a better flow. All right, some things will be added to statistics and probability and again, it's just to make it a little bit easier on both ends. The Common Core standards took trigonometry away from geometry, and they renamed it Algebra 2. And now the next generation standards are going to potentially put trigonometry back in. The experts are still kind of weighing in on this, so it's not permanent. So I don't want everyone to stick to this and then hold me accountable. This is not set in stone yet. 
All right. The Common Core really didn't organize specific maths high school course taking sequences. And now the common the next generation standards is going to do the exact opposite. So on the left, if you can't really see it too well, they have it from kindergarten all the way down to grade eight. And underneath they have subcategories speaking about high school functions, modeling, geometry. And the biggest difference is that now when we're dealing with the next generation, is that they have it by courses. So you no longer have to sift through these bottom ones looking for which grade does this apply to. If you want to look up the standards for your child or for your students, you can actually look it up by the course they're taking, whether they're in pre-K, grades one through eight, whether they're taking algebra one, two, geometry, et cetera. All right, now Amy O'Leary will be coming up. Good evening. Okay, so I am going to highlight some information about the New York State Generation Standards for ELA. So why is the shift going to happen from Common Core to Next Generation Standards? Our goal is to better prepare students for lifelong creative learners. We want our students to be able to collaborate, communicate, critical think, as well as be civic in our community. So in the grand scheme of things, we're going to take a look at the 21st century learner. We want our students to have these four C's. They are communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and being creative. And I think Rockville Center, I'm sorry, I think Rockville Center does a good job providing the students with those foundational skills. New York State Generation Standards, learning standards will be reduced. Uh, they are more streamlined, the standards. The edited practices become more part of the <clears throat> lifelong learners. There's a whole part in the standards that talks about how <clears throat> they want the students to be lifelong learners in reading and mathematics and thinking. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I've got a little allergies going. The, no, I'm good, I'm okay for now. The merging of the standards across genres are from literature and information. So they're going to take the literature, thank you. The literature and information, they're going to merge it. They're going to support the cognitive development of children. So the age appropriateness and play, like Darnell was talking about, the clarification of expectations, the alignment to the content for social studies and science. They are improved coherency and focus, and they also will maintain rigor for the students. So the overall, the board approved this in September 11th, 2017. They revised the standards. They edited things. They edited things. Um, we actually had one of our very own teachers go up to Albany during the summer. Phyllis Johnson participated in making those standards. Her voice heard for Rockville Center, which was wonderful. Response to feedback from the families and teachers, politicians, and communities the importance of meeting the whole child. When Phyllis went, she discussed with them and the other members that the other standards, the Common Core standards, really didn't focus on the whole child. These standards focus on the whole child, the developmental process of how a child <clears throat> sorry, is expected to learn within a positive environment, a strong home school community, and those high expectations will be met for student success. Uh, the decisions are based on the individual districts. So Rockville Center will make those individual um, decisions based on the materials for reading and for writing and how they're going to gauge that. Do you want to talk anything about that? Well, just in terms of in the past, when Common Core first came out, there were modules that were created by the state that they paid to, to put out. And people started to jump on those and use those. And they were promoted and pushed. And, and really, people felt that they, the state was foisting a curriculum on people. They were taking decisions away from local school boards and, and superintendents. And this now is, as Darnell showed, and, and uh, Amy's talking to, the fact that uh, standards are there, but there are different ways to reach those standards. And those decisions will be made uh, at the individual district level. 
So the English language arts standards <clears throat> are organized by grade level from pre-K through grade eight, and they also have grade bands from 9, 10 to 11, 12 at the high school level. The anchor standards are a broad statement, and I'll show you later on in the slides about an example of what the standards will look like. There are 28 English language arts anchor standards in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. The strands define the actual main organization of the categories for reading, writing, and speaking, and listening also. And the range of students' experience section explains that the reading and the text complexity is there. So <clears throat> for reading, the complexity versus the literature, they want to make sure that it's enriched. So the teachers have to make sure, and along with our professional development, that they will be getting an enriched um, English language arts experience. So here is an example of how the grade level is set up with the grade strand. So this is a strand for this, the writing for fifth grade. This is the type of writing, so this is the purpose. These are all the standards that go along with fifth grade. And here's another one for the organization of grade bands. So they banded together the standards one and two by the end of grade five, so this is grades three, three and five are banded together. They're, by the end of fifth grade, they should be able to complete all these competencies, all these standards within grades three through five. And the changes, some changes are noteworthy. There are no longer separate standard strands for reading information and literature and writing. The number of standards has been streamlined and consolidated, and they've been moved to the long life practices of writing. They're promoting the advanced literacy for English language learners and multilingual, as well as all students with disabilities. The changes continue. The number of anchor standards went from 34 to 28 based upon the educational concerns, but there were too many, and they were also very repetitive. Uh, the removal of the term with guidance and support within the standards was removed. The uh, argumentative writing is now introduced in grade three. Previously, it was introduced in grade six. However, they think that that is age appropriate. That committee of uh, teachers and family members and community members all agreed to that. And of course, the link that's provided, you can uh, access more information about that. The crosswalk. A crosswalk is the sample of the new, well, revised Common Core standards versus the next generation standards. So here is a crosswalk. And I'm not too familiar with your clicker, Darnell. There we go. So this is the Common Core on this side. And this is the revised standard on the left side. Right side, left side. So, so these documents were helpful right. in that they could put side by side the changes. Teachers were alerted to those changes. And you'd see a lot of uh, words that, again, trying to not be as verbose, uh, as repetitive, and really streamline what's happening. OK. And our professional development within Rockefeller Center will continue. We will be preparing our students for the 21st century learning, differentiated instruction, academic vocabulary, real-world real world problems, project-based learning, cross-curricular teaching, all that good stuff. And where do we go from here? The next generation standards will be first tested in the spring of 2021. We're going to pilot the NWA as an alternative adaptive test where there can be 60 minutes for both ELA and math assessments. A bridge time will only be two days for the testing. And of course, here is the link for the um, English language arts next generation standards. Here is our outline, our rollout for important dates. Yeah, I'll just jump in for a second, Amy. You'll see here the capacity. We're in a capacity building year this year and next year. Uh, we are busy building capacity. And the two day assessments began this year in ELA and in math. We had some concerns about uh, ELA, which we discussed here. It seemed like the three day assessment simply became a two day assessment by putting everything into the two days, which was really unfortunate. Uh, 
we'll have more feedback about math as, as today was the second day of the math. But we are building capacity. We're working with our professionals locally, our teachers, and providing professional development. And uh, that continues through 1920. And then there will be full implementation in 2020. Our professional development, our curriculum writing will have taken place by then. And then in spring of that year, 2021, they will be beginning uh, implementing the new grade three through eight tests that will measure the new standards, the next generation learning standards. And that's it. I just did that slide for you, Amy. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's OK. Thank you. Any questions for Donnell or Amy or myself? Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, I have lots of questions. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> don't, go, don't go away. Are we putting this presentation on our website? That will definitely be on the website. Yes, I'll work with Lauren tomorrow to get it up. Thank you. That was, uh, that was very important. So right now, um, we're still in Common Core. We're moving to our next generation in learning standards. Um, and we're testing on Common Core. So, so ease parents' minds as they start testing on, they continue to test on Common Core for the next year, and we're moving into next generation. So we're continuing to teach Common Core standards, which was always Rockville Center-based anyway. Our approach to Common Core, as we, we like to say, so uh, it was rigorous, and it was uh, uh, the four C's was something I've talked about for years when we started handing out uh, I, uh, giving iPads to students as part of our uh, technology initiative. So uh, we are not doing kind of a bait and switch where we're teaching to next generation but still testing kids on uh, Common Core. We are, it, we are in the capacity building stages. So we're learning, we're doing some professional development around next generation, but we are still teaching Common Core and we are still testing Common Core. Okay. And then we'll slowly start changing curriculum a little bit time. Right, and, and be ready for 2020 and then that same year, right? It's the 2020, 2021 school year. No, the spring of 2021 is when the first iteration of the new test is going to emerge. So what, um, what, are, what are parents going to see different? Like, what are there, like things, for example, I mean, we all sat through the, the, the fear of common core in math, where 10 plus 10 wasn't 20, 10 plus 10 is 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. And, 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 right? and, and sort of, are, are we going to still see this? Is this going to change? Like, how, how are parents going to? Um, when you're comparing the Common Core standards to the next generation, the Common Core is more like a foundation. Now, when you look at the next generation standards, we're taking that foundation and we're just tweaking it as we go along. So you're still going to see some parts of the Common Core, but they're just going to try to make it just a little bit more. It's more user-friendly. User-friendly. User user-friendly to the teachers, it's user-friendly to the kids. Yeah, and to both parties, at least. So I think here's something you'll see a little bit of a change. Kids went home in third grade with their math, and mom and dad tried to help them, and kids said, you can't do it that way. I'm going to get in trouble. Mrs. is going to be upset with me. Much more so with math in the LA. Yep, right. yeah. There were and so specific ways you had to do that adults couldn't understand. Because again, the, the standards led themselves to, to that kind of specificity with the modules and curriculum that was created by the state, and people felt, well, we have to be in line with that. Uh, so I, I think you'll start to see uh, a greater acceptance of uh, methods. And, but we, we do want to still go deeper with the math and not just rely on remote, uh, on uh, rote memorization or the old uh, Ours is not to wonder why, just invert and multiply. We, we want kids to actually, you know what that means? I've never heard of that. You never heard that? No. Has anyone heard that? Thank you. Heard Thank that? you. I've never heard that. Yes. So uh, ours is to wonder why. And we want to make sure so our kids do wonder. Can I just jump in here for a minute? One of the things we need to understand is that when the Common Core Standards were adopted by New York State, they jumped in and did two things. One, they adopted the standards, but they also then developed the modules which they considered a statewide curriculum. And many of us who, who looked at it thought that this was the state's interpretation of the standards and thereby was going to be. What they did this time with the next generation is they have turned it back on the school districts and the state has said very clearly to school districts statewide 
that they are not in the business of developing curriculum anymore. So. <laughs> Uh, we should point out that we never, we never bought into the modules here. Modules. We did not. We did not. We we looked at the standards, and then uh, as and Chris coordinates it every year, we in fact develop our own curriculum that in fact matched what we thought to be the standards. Uh, the the real issue uh, will be with the next generation tests, because tests drive curriculum so that in the absence of any see that there was some consistency between the standards the modules and the tests what is happening right now is that school districts need to interpret the next generation standards on their own develop curriculum and hope they prepare kids adequately for the tests that will begin to emerge in the 2021 school year, which will be the first year in which it will be fully implemented and the first, as I said just a few minutes ago, the first iteration of those new generation tests will show up. It's a little bit unnerving, uh, and I know that many of my colleagues statewide are in fact looking for more guidance from the state so that we will be able to more adequately prepare kids for the next generation of tests that will be arriving on our doorstep in 2021. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but the, 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 the logic, it does make sense to push it back on schools. We're very familiar with that and we're very comfortable with it. But understand there will be a whole new wave of state tests. We don't know what they look like, or in fact, we're not sure what they're gonna test at this point. We don't know, nor do they. But at least we have a little time. To, unlike, unlike Common Core, we have time. They actually added a, right. This was supposed to be in the, in the uh, 1920 school year. They actually moved it back a year and put it into the 2021 school year for exactly that reason. All of us universally said we need more time. But it doesn't help us much if they put it out 10 years, if they don't give us guidance on you know, what the test will be about, that we will need to develop some kind of curriculum to get there. So if they don't give us that guidance until the year before, it really doesn't benefit anything. And I'm not sure at all that Questar, who is in fact the, per the consulting firm that is currently working with the state, will be on the scene at the time that these new tests, they've, they've, they've not done a stellar job as far as many of us are concerned in the evolution of the test since they walked away from Pearson. And consequently, uh, testing in New York State it continues to be a huge controversy. In, in, in addition, because of the uh, poor rollout of the Common Core test for, for a number of years at this point, it's not the the mentality is not going to change unless the parents buy into this as well. Right. And <clears throat> it, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to need to be proven to them. To, to us, you know, we're, you know, many of us subscribe to that as well. This, this has been done poorly from the onset, and until things are modified and uh, actually shown to that we are not irreparably harming their children, it's not going to change. The mentality will not change. I think meetings such as this, where we get out in front of the public and we talk about it, we had a PTA curriculum where our guests uh, presented as well. Uh, so I, I think those are opportunities very well said, Mark. We, we have to get people back on our side, yeah. Yeah, the other thing you have to keep in mind, by the way, even though we call them the next generation standards, somewhere between 85 and 90% of the Common Core is included in the next generation standards. And uh, where there were significant changes was one area where Phyllis Johnson, who is a member of the Wilson teaching staff, actually worked with the State Education Department on the early childhood English language arts. That, that had been within the Common Core probably one of the more critical areas and where most school districts had great deal of difficulty imposing that on their teachers and in and the early childhood education. So when you talked earlier about Donnell, I think you were talking about the fact that they did bring in early childhood specialists, they did. They worked with teachers and in fact, that's where most of the change took place. The other was in math at the high school. And uh, that's still in a state of flux. Okay, can we talk about math at the high school? Go right ahead. For a moment. 
So we're looking back, or they're considering trigonometry. One thing I think everybody should know is where we have not dropped trigonometry from our algebra two. There's still, well, there's still a piece of that in there. I mean, obviously, we have to meet the standards for algebra to right. prepare students for, an, for the regents and the assessment. But yes, uh, we know that it best prepares our students for what comes next uh, in, in our course of studies. So we, we did not wholesale make changes that I think perhaps a lot of other districts did. Right. And, uh, so are we, Dr. Johnson, are you talking to the state about trying to get more trigonometry back in that? So yes, that, that is continuing. Yep. Just understand, though, that they are, for whatever the reason, they seem to be more vested in preparing kids for statistics rather than calculus. And so they, they made a conscious decision a few years ago, once you pull out that trigonometry, then you, you are moving kids more in the direction of preparing them for uh, statistics as a follow-up course to the trilogy that they have currently in place. I know you've mentioned it in the presentation. As we're going through this kind of shift, how do you find that the NWA is keeping up with this shift into the next generation? And how are our scores? Are they kind of staying the same? Are they dropping at all because of this? I'm just curious as to how well you still feel that that is as a measurement. So we utilized the NWEA initially prior to Common Core. We, uh, they made their own adjustments to reflect the Common Core standards. Our students did not hit a bump or anything uh, along the lines of that. Uh, and then uh, they will have to, yes, again, go back in and make sure that they're meeting the standards that are new next generation standards as opposed to national common core standards. But each time they do that, they, they go in on the back end through uh, using psychometrics and they recalculate uh, the RIT scores and the, the, uh, how students do on the test. And, and again, this has happened to us once and will happen again, but our students still national N nationally are doing very well. Um, more questions? Uh, yeah, ELA, as Common Core came in, there was a push towards more nonfiction reading. Are we continuing that? Is that changed at all? So it's interesting. They, uh, Can I talk? Please. <laughs> And then I'll, let's see if we're going to um, say the same thing. They want a good balance. They want to make sure that the literature is enriching for the, for the students. They want to expose them to a multitude of variety of, of, of text. I, I think that's that? indicated by the fact that they used to have in Common Core a reading for literature uh, right. area and a reading for information. And they actually combine those. So I think they recognize that we need to have a mix and a balance of both that we can't go one way or completely the other way. So yes, I think the balance is going to be there. And then lastly, you mentioned next generation science for next standards. Those have also changed? Are you? Uh... We are in the midst of those changes as well. They, they, this timeline and rollout is much clearer than what's happening with science. Science, they're still not certain as to when it will be fully uh, implemented. We have started that implementation because there is a test in, in fourth grade that measures our science. So uh, this past year, kindergarten, we, we piloted some new science kits in kindergarten, and those were successful. So we're going to move that to first grade. So next year, we'll have next generation science standards in K and 1. And we'll continue to roll that out each year until we finally know exactly what's happening. But our high school, our science people are looking at it as well making those adjustments, uh, a lot of the earlier adjustments. And I do have a presentation that we'll do at some point, uh, maybe in the fall or later, not much time, not many uh, opportunities this year, but uh, where again, it's, it's people get concerned around the word play or play-based, but it, it, it should be engaging, it should be fun, mm -hmm. and kids should be learning at the same time, and that's something we can definitely do. Could I just get back to Tara, to the question you raised about the NWEA? Mm -hmm. The NWEA is, is just not an adaptive test for kids. Uh, you know, there, there is a single vertical scale that they utilize so that it, it is an adaptive measure, but it is also adaptive in another way. And that is that one of the reasons why I was able to adapt very quickly to the Common Core is that they are continually revising items and building items into and embedding those items into the format of the questions that are, that are posed to kids on a regular basis. So built into the model is a revisionist 
uh, philosophy in which they are constantly introducing and revising their questions. They're going to be able to adapt very quickly to the, to the newest standards in New York State. Other tests are, are probably going to have a, some problems. Uh, the NWEA will not, not in the current configuration of the adaptive format. There's a whole other format that we're working with them on developing. But I can tell you that, that we're very confident that they are going to be able to adapt quickly, easily, and effectively uh, to the new generation standards, if they haven't already. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Donnell. Thank you. Uh, Donnell, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Amy, Appreciate thank you very much. Your work. Great job. Do you need me to write a pass to get back to class? Or you're good? OK. Thank you very much once again. We have one other item for information, Dr. Johnson. Uh, yes. And then I have a couple of announcements that I wanted to make. Uh, the. Uh, Police investigation that took place a while back, I know, created a good deal of consternation in this community. And I think people, when they read it in the newspaper, felt very threatened, particularly those who were in attendance at the Wilson School. There are, there are two pieces that, that uh, have been confirmed pretty much to us uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, it is still an open investigation. We have been working with both the county and the local uh, police department. But it is very clear to us that the, uh, that the action was targeted to a single individual and that uh, at the time that, that we were working with the Rockville Center Police and to this day, we don't believe that, it, that anybody except that one individual was in fact targeted by this, if the, if the, the, the perpetrator, uh, start using police terms when you, you hang out with them long enough. But, uh, the other big issue really had to do with the concern that people had over at Wilson School that, there, that this person did show up at the Wilson School. Uh, we have no evidence to that. We've looked at tapes. We actually had the Nassau County Police come in and spend it in the better part of uh, about six hours with us uh, one afternoon reviewing all of the tapes and came up nothing. So I can assure you that, that, that whatever uh, someone thought they saw, uh, cannot be substantiated by any evidence that either the police were able to find that we can turn up. So there needs to be an assurance to the Wilson community that that person did not go there and was never there on that campus or in the vicinity of that campus to the point that it's able to be uh, confirmed by us or the local police departments. So uh, we need to assure people, one, that it was targeted, and number two, uh, the Wilson School is was and is a very, very safe place for our children. OK. All right? Thank you. Yep. Two announcements I wanted to make, sure. if it's all right with you. I know there's no opportunity for. <laughs> However, uh, the uh, enrollment in the summer enrichment program, which is essentially a K-8 program, which is held over at Hewitt School, uh, we're very close to uh, 450 kids. Uh, and we only have two more days remaining before the deadline to receive the 10% discount ends. So I sound like an advertisement right now. You know, this is the time for the commercials. Uh, but if you intend to register, please do so before May 4th and take advantage of the 10% discount. But things are disappearing very quickly as choices for our children. Uh, we've had an incredible response. So. Dr. Leahy, thank you very much for coordinating all of that. But uh, so the, uh, the other thing, on May 17th and 18th, uh, for those of you who are uh, addicted, uh, Center Stage is going to put on another presentation this year. It's their 10th anniversary this year. And uh, it will be at Southside High School on uh, the 17th and the 18th at 7 p.m. It's just a wonderful experience. And what has struck me over the years is the number of families who come together uh, to sit in there and enjoy uh, the time with their classmates and the kids here at Southside High School. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, we generally sell out the performances. So again, if there's any opportunity to do so, get those tickets early. So. Uh, 
it's an incredible opportunity, a great program, and I would encourage just not we as adults to go, but bring your children. It's a really a fun time. So that's it, Mr. President. If, uh, Dr. Leahy, could you tell us how to get the tickets? Do you have that? It's a. Sure. There's a uh, there's an order form going around. There should be. Um, I'm really quite sure if it's on the website, but I'll see that it is. But it's available at the middle school and the high school. Ms. Monsoor at the middle school is a point of contact, and a teaching assistant at the high school, uh, Ms. Coglin at the high school. So they'll res if you go online, they'll reserve tickets for you? Mm -hmm. So it's J. Monsoor, M-O-N-S-O-U-R, at, at rvcschools.org. That's her, her contact info. So thank you very much. Dr. Johnson, we have some gifts. Uh, yes, we have three gifts that I would recommend that we accept. One is a camera and camera equipment from a district resident uh, to be used here uh, by Southside High School photography students. Second is a six-foot park bench from the Southside Booster Club, which will be installed along the booster walk at Southside High School. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's worth it's worth the walk. Uh, <laughs> so. Now you can actually sit and enjoy. <laughs> so. Anyway, and then we have a $2,000 from the Tommy Brell Foundation to be used to purchase sneakers for the core student participants in the Achilles Kids program this year. So we thank all three for their generosity. So. Thank you. Right. have a motion to accept the gifts? Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention this is a really wonderful, very generous gift by the Tommy Brill Foundation. <coughs> it's allowing our teachers, specifically Meg Healy here in the high school and the phys ed teachers in the middle school um, as well, are helping uh, children in the core program. Um, basically, they run a marathon over the course of a year. And if they cl complete the marathon over the course of the year, they get a free pair of sneakers. And it used to be fully funded program by um, Adidas, uh, but it is now, uh, now you have to pay for the sneakers. And we were going to have to stop the program. And now uh, Tommy Bull has come forward to, to buy the sneakers for the kids. We think it's really wonderful. It promotes exercise and fitness and the core program. And they have a ball. They really have a lot of fun. Does it still have to be Adidas? <laughs> There, there is a grant in front of the Education Foundation as well, and I know we're going to have them in uh, May 23rd, but there's a grant. Uh, they applied for a grant as well to, to supplement those monies. It is really a fantastic program. So if anyone knows anyone in the sneaker industry, we'd be certainly interested in speaking with you. Thank you. Thanks. I have a motion to approve the minutes as listed in the agenda. A second? Second. Any questions? Hold on. Um, Jack, Jack, I think it's on the regular meeting. Uh -huh. um, there's an extra dollar sign. Okay. Yeah. On the regular meeting? Yeah. April 17th? Yeah. Okay. Barring that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Can I have a motion to approve the financial reports as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I have a motion to acknowledge receipt of the financial reports as, re, reports as listed on the agenda? So Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Board actions. Can I have a motion to accept items A through E plus any addenda? A through D. A through D. Why do I have the oh. Just shake it where it gives. OK. So we're going to change that to A through D, plus any addenda. So moved. Second? Second. <laughs> any questions? We need to get our, we need to get our act on the show. Can you only just explain why um, in the contracts, the health services in Mineola is so different than Westbury? Uh, it's all dependent on how many uh, students I guess they have within the district uh, that they're charged for the health services and how much the cost of the health services are for that particular district. So 
uh, depending on, the state has a basically formula, formula that we have to utilize. Um, so each district does it separately, but then you take up all of your health services, you divide it by the total number of students, and that's really <coughs> what comes up with the difference in the costs. It, so it means that the school that is located in Mineola has many students from Rockville Center, and the school that's located in the Westbury School District has very few. So basically, it's the same dollar per student. It's just a cost per. No, it's not you know. the same dollar per student. The opposite. I'm sorry. Though. The, the, f the formula allows them to to use whatever the cost is of their staff uh, to push it on to the local school districts that send kids to those schools. Okay, so I thought you said something about the state giving you a. The state does have a formula for doing that. So it has a formula. That they oh, okay, so it's a percentage of oh, it's whatever of their cost, but every district could have a different cost. Right? Yeah, and we'll build have... like we have our own cost, which we build to other districts who have students that go to St. Agnes. Okay, all right. All right. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Can I have a motion to accept item E? So moved. Any questions? A second, I should say, first? Second. Oh, Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Aye. Thank you. I have a motion to retire into executive Before session. You, can I ask one more budget related question, Mr. President? Of course you can. Thank you, sir. We'll, uh, I should have asked it earlier, but I wasn't sure if there'd be another privilege to the floor. Have we made a decision yet to uh, go out to bid on busing again uh, this year when the current contract expires? Do you want me? I would say, can I, can I answer that in part? You can. Yeah, we're continuing to examine it, Jeffrey, and, and I think that uh, pretty much the deadline for making that decision will be May 23rd when the Board of Education uh, convenes again here. So we look forward to it possibly being on the agenda that day? It, there is a possibility. No, that, not the bid itself, but, but a decision as to whether or not we're going to bid it or not. Uh, I urge us to take advantage of the fact that for the first time in my memory, we had more than one vendor bid on the regular contract, not the special ed contract, this past December. And being that the contract does expire, I think we should take advantage of the environment that more than one bidder is interested, and it can only go down, in my mind, it can't go up in that type of uh, <coughs> bidding environment. It's called competition, and it's good, and we have it, and let's not lose that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just before we do end our meeting, I'd like to remind everybody that on Tuesday, May 15th, there is a vote here at the high school from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. I know what was said already. Uh, it is a the annual election for two board seats that are open and our 18-19 school year budget vote. So uh, I urge everybody to come out and, and use the privilege of voting and take that opportunity to vote here at the high school. Um, um, SEP is housing a, a question, is hosting a question and answer tomorrow at the middle school at 615. I believe it's in the library. If it's going to be somewhere else, it'll be addressed at the building. Dr. Johnson reminded everybody at center stage. Our next regular Board of Edu Education meeting is in this room, May 23rd. It starts at 8 p.m., not 7.30. I don't know why. Do we know why? Scheduling. Okay, whatever. Thank you, it's better for my schedule. <laughs> it's an unusual time, that's uh, why I just wanted to mention it. Here at okay. I left someone else with the dinner chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I have a motion to retire into executive session for discussion of specific personnel, contractual, and litigation matters? Can I have a second? Second. Any questions? No? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much for attending.